voice of joy at his right hand pleasures forevermore I am his and he is mine oh what fellowship divine in the presence of the Lord fullness of and let's just praise the Lord, praise the Lord. Let's just lift our hearts toward heaven and praise the Lord. Let's just praise the Lord, praise the Lord. Let's just lift our hearts to heaven and praise the Lord. Well, that's great singing. Country song here, Mansion Over the Hilltop. Great song. I think you'll enjoy it. Let's sing it again. I'm satisfied with just a cottage below a little silver and a little gold but in that Singing choir song this morning, Cindy tonight. Just been great. Really been great. 
I don't plan on leaving this earth until the Lord wants to snatch me away. But uh, in the event that I do, I've said before, I, you got to sing that one at my funeral, man. When they're, when they're wheeling me out, <laughs> be singing that, will you? Unfortunately, by the time I die, no one may know that song, right? <laughs> They'll go, what's that? I never heard that one before. But uh, we sang that at my mother's funeral and uh, one of the things she wanted. So good to see you here tonight. Good to be in the house of the Lord. Uh, right, uh, Gary Altair, will you come up and open us in prayer if you'll do that tonight? Pray if you will. Brother Mark got to go see Paul Wallace this afternoon. He'll be having his surgery tomorrow. Pray for Paul, if you will. Alan Jackson, doing well at home, but continue, if you will, to remember him. John Morgan. Patty Davis was here this morning, kind of overdid it, I think, being here. Continue to pray for her, if you will. Then Jimmy Davis, uh, who is recovering from that stroke, and Ellen Tremor, if you will do that. A lot to be thankful for, a lot of folks to be praying about, but pray for those, if you will. Gary, open us in prayer, will you please? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we're so thankful again to be in your house this night, Lord. What a blessing this day has been so far, Lord. We trust it will be a blessing in that as well, Lord. Just pray to be with Mark tonight as he brings the message to us, Lord. Open our hearts up to the words, Lord. Father, the names that were mentioned, Lord, those uh, facing surgeries, those recovering from procedures, Lord, those with illnesses, uh, the hands raised this morning for those with personal needs. Father, you know each and every one. Father, we know you have the power to heal, uh, the power to help those in pain, Lord, the power to provide comfort, Lord, and we just trust that you will, Lord. Lord, we just pray to be with us throughout this week, Lord. I just pray to... Uh, uh, bless those that need blessings, Lord, and we just thank you for everything you do in advance. Lord, we ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. I like when you get excited about singing and serving the Lord. I like when you clap your hands. I wish you'd do that more, okay? I don't want to have to coach you to do something you don't want to do, but if you were at that football game tonight, you'd have your shirt off and be painted a color and everything else and yelling and screaming. Get to the house of the Lord, man, and let's uh, clap your hands. Feel good about it. I tell you what, uh, it's just, uh, I'm glad when you do that. It's, there's a good excitement about that. I know the Lord is pleased with all of that. So uh, uh, but it's, it's a good day to be here. I'm looking forward to tonight. Next Sunday evening, Daniel Ford, he's our missionary to Moldova. This is a man with a very tender heart. And when he was here on a Wednesday evening, uh, uh, I guess I didn't come expecting what he delivered that night. And shame on me. He was just brokenhearted for that ministry gave a wonderful report, and I'm looking forward to the next Sunday night. You want to be here and listen to Daniel and his ministry, one of the many missionaries that we do support, and, uh, uh, and uh, I know he'll be a blessing. And then the end of the month on a Wednesday night, we'll have uh, Brother Johan, I guess, from India. He'll be presenting in a Wednesday night service for us. And then we're planning some other things for the summer. Brother Jerry's got the Wisnets coming here uh, uh, for a Sunday evening. We're going to plan to get some other things going. And uh, a lot of things we're looking forward to, so uh, you stay in touch. Uh, hopefully, I saw a lot of folks with your uh, directories today. So uh, they're out in the foyer. Doris has all of those ready. Make sure you get those, if you will. Then uh, some things you want to pass out. Again, plenty of business cards with the church information on it. Plenty of these. If you want to pass these out, we'd love for you to do that uh, to let folks know about us. And uh, we talked yesterday about some evangelism things with the deacons, some different ideas from billboards and everything else to try to get the word out. So uh, we'll be presenting those, some, of the, some of those things to the church. But the most important thing you could do, those you come in contact with, tell them about Yellow River Baptist Church, put something in their hand, and uh, invite them. And uh, tell them, uh, if you tell them, uh, come to church and I'll buy you lunch, 50% of the people will come, all right? So uh, don't get cheap on us, <laughs> all right? Buy somebody lunch, take them out to lunch, fellowship with them, and I think you will get an amazing response. Ushers, you want to get in your place, and we'll get ready to take up the offering tonight. There we go. Get the guys who want to get a full plate tonight. Let's pray. Our Father, I thank you for just the wonderful time it is to be in your house today, Father, from just early arrival today through the Sunday school hour and the service this morning and already tonight, Lord, how good it is to be here and to be able to fellowship and worship together and lift our voices and hearts towards you. Lord, you're so good to this church and continue to be so just through the generosity of your people. I thank you for that. Father, I thank you for this opportunity to give again to you tonight. And Lord, I just always pray that you'd make us wise stewards of these gifts. Father, we'd be able to use them all for your honor and glory. And as a result of that, Lord, 
eternity to reveal the fact that uh, these generous gifts were used to allow others an opportunity to receive you as Lord and Savior. So, Father, we thank you for this special time we have tonight. Bless everything that's given for us in Christ's name we pray. Amen. <laughs> Take your Bibles, turn to Ephesians chapter 6. I know you are, some of you, interested in getting home and watching the Super Bowl. I understand that. I'm mindful of that. Uh, so here's the message. If you aren't saved, get saved. If you are saved, live like it. Let's pray. <laughs> All right. Ephesians chapter 6. I'll be honest with you, I can care less about the Broncos and the Seahawks. Uh, I really could. Uh, but... Uh, but I'll be mindful of it. I know what's going on. And uh, we won't be any longer than normal tonight. Ephesians chapter 6. I'm going to begin a series. My timing is not always the greatest. I was not thinking, to be honest with you, about Daniel Ford being here next week. And by the way, the pastor was exactly right on target. What a fantastic young couple the Fords are. And uh, you don't want to miss next Sunday night. But uh, I want to go ahead and start the series tonight anyway. Uh, in hindsight, I may have wished I would have waited till after they were here so I could be more consistent with it. But then I think it, uh, you've got good memories and in two weeks you can handle that. But Ephesians chapter 6, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to preach a series of messages on the matter of spiritual warfare. Right now, if you are sitting in the room, and when I say that, your first thought is, well, this doesn't apply to me, you are the person that this series is for. That is the absolute reality of the matter. If Satan can get us to believe that spiritual warfare is not real, that spiritual warfare does not exist, we are defeated in that realm. He cannot take your salvation. I hope that everyone understands that, and I don't need to go back and review that with you. He cannot take your salvation. So the best thing for him to do is to render us useless in the work of Christ. If he can do that, that then he has the victory as far as going forward, as far as he can obtain the victory. He can't steal your salvation from you. Romans chapter 8, verses 38 and 39 are extremely, extremely clear about that. So if he can render us useless, then he's won the battle going forward from your salvation. If you think that the battle does not pertain to you, then you're defeated. You are already defeated. Because I want to share with you this, first of all. Satan wants to, to defeat any and every believer. You say, well, I don't pose much threat. The reason we don't pose much threat is because he's winning the battle. And so those that do pose great threat, let me tell you, the enemy wants to take you out of the game. I have coached for a long time and been very blessed and been fairly successful with it. I can assure you that I focus my defensive strategy on the player that is most likely to keep me from winning the game. The guy who can't play dead in the Western, I'll let him shoot all day long. He's not hurting me anyway. 
It's the guy who's scoring the ball is the one I've got to try to stop. And so if you are doing something, he's going to want to try to stop you. If you're not doing anything, we've got to get you back in the game. We've got to get you back in the game because he's got you on the sideline as it is right now. All of that being said so that you understand that this series is for everybody. Joe, from the youngest teenager that's in the room tonight to the oldest senior adult that's in the room tonight and all of us in between, to those who have been saved just a few years or a few months, to those that have been saved 60 years, all of us, all of us have a target on our back from the enemy. You say, well, I didn't think he really cared that much about me. Well, you're thinking a little high of yourself. It's not that he thinks so much about you. His battle is with your heavenly father. And so to get to your heavenly father, he is going after what is nearest and dearest to the heart of God, and that is the same thing that's nearest and dearest to my heart. It's my children. He is going after the child of God. And so that is exactly what is transpiring. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10 will not be on the screen. But verse 10 says this, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord. Now that ought to be the goal of every one of us. Tonight I hope to get this series very much foundational and grounded to you. Tonight as we begin it and we kind of launch into it. It ought to be the desire of every person in the room to be strong in the Lord. He says be strong in the Lord and and in the power of his might. How do I do that? How do I become strong in the Lord? It's not enough just to talk about it. It's not enough just to hope that it happens. He says, be strong in the Lord, and this is how you do it. This is the series. Put on the whole armor of God. Not a piece of it, not a part of it, but each and every piece of it. And through the course of the series, we're going to examine Every piece. You say, I've done that before. We're going to examine it, I hope, in a depth uh, situation, maybe like that you haven't examined it before. To look at, am I putting on the armor? Because there is a battle. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Not to run from the devil, not to let Satan get the upper hand on you, but that you can stand against him. And you say, well, why do I need to stand against him? Why do I need to stand against the devil? Don't don't I just need to do good? Don't I just need to do right? Listen, you need to stand against him because of verse 12. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood. Our battle is not with an unsaved person. Understand that. Our battle should not be, shame on us if it is, on a believer within the body of Christ. The battle that we face, he goes on to tell us, is against principalities, is against powers. It is against rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. I'll I'll oversimplify it here. There is God and his angels. But Satan has his angels also. We call them demons. Those demons are, have orders just like the angelic beings have orders. There's archangels. There's other angels that, and there's an order with them. But Satan has this as well. He's got principalities. He's got powers. He's got spiritual wickedness that transpires in high places. In those high places is where Job was accused by Satan before God. And and Satan is the accuser of the brethren. It's a real battle that transpires. It is a real battle that transpires that calls Paul in Romans to say, the things I want to do, I don't do them. Now I know you don't face that battle at all. Just Paul faced that. Paul said, but the things I know I ought to do, I don't do them. And the things I shouldn't do, those are the things I do sometimes. And here's the truth of the matter, believer. You could say that too, couldn't you? You could say that as well. Why is that? 
Are you just rotten? Don't answer that. We are fleshly beings. And Satan attacks, uses his demons to attack, uses all of the influence of this world and the culture of this world that our pastor talked about this morning. Let me tell you, the things he talked about this morning, that culture does not please the heart of God. You folks know that. Well, if that's the case, where does it come from? Where does it come from? Who is permeating a culture among our young people that says there is no absolutes, there is no right or wrong, there is no morality that you need to uphold? If we even remotely think that comes from God, Satan's already winning the battle, isn't he? And so there is a spiritual warfare that takes place. You want to be strong in the Lord, then you've got to put on all of the armor because there is a spiritual battle that you are in. Newsflash for us. You cannot win the battle alone. You will lose. Your family will lose. Your son will lose. Your daughter will lose. You will lose. You cannot go. There is a battle, okay? There's no denying that. Verse 13, is, or 12, excuse me, is as clear as it can be. There is a battle. You cannot go toe-to-toe -to -toe with Satan. Everybody got that? If you think you can, I'm going to tell you right now, first night of the series, you lose. You lose. But I also want to tell you this, greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. So we've got to do what he says to do to win the battle. Verse 13, wherefore take unto you the whole armor of God. Notice that's two times, verse 11 and verse 13. How much of the armor does he say put on? All of it. Two times, right? Verse 11, verse 13, whole armor, whole armor. A piece of it's not the case. You cannot leave yourself exposed in this. It is a matter of claiming every bit of yourself for the king of kings. It's not, the Ephesians also puts it this way, neither give place to the devil. Don't give him an opening. Don't give him a crack to work in. Put on the whole armor that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand. He doesn't, it doesn't look like to me that the Christian is supposed to cower. The Christian is supposed to stand. The saying is you've got to stand for something or you'll fall for anything. What do I have to stand for? The truth. What do you have to stand for? The truth. Know what you believe, know why you believe it, and put on the armor of God and stand for it. It's not going to be popular. It's, it's not. I wish that my message tonight was that if you stand for the Lord, you will be the most popular person in the school. You'll be the most popular person on the job. You'll preach the most popular message that has ever been preached. The reality is I'd be lying to you. But here's the deal, stand anyway. Stand anyway. you got to stand for something or you're going to fall for anything. And so it goes on, he says, stand therefore again, that's verse 14. Having your loins girt about with the truth, I hope we get to talk to that tonight. And having on the breastplate of righteousness and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith. Don't, don't go without the shield. I, I love that when he says above all. Put on all this stuff, but don't forget the shield. Be sure you've got faith. Because Hebrews eleven six still says that without faith, it's impossible to please him. He says, wherewith you shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. Take the helmet of salvation, the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. He gives us some advantages, gives us some opportunities. I want you to understand this as we jump into this thing tonight. Because life 
is smooth does not mean there is no battle. If you, if you take that approach, you're going to lose. If you take that approach, you're going to be in trouble. You all are intelligent people. If you look at what he's talking about and putting on this armor, ask yourself a very pointed question. Do I get dressed for the battle after the battle starts or do I get dressed for the battle and be ready at all times? What, what do you do? Talk to me. You got to be ready at all times. Because you never know when the enemy's going to strike. You never know when the battle's going to come. You never know from what angle the attack is going to be. Now, it's a, really a poor analogy, but I'll go ahead and use it anyway because it's on many folks' mind. When they play the Super Bowl, you don't go put on your helmet and shoulder pads after you get hit. You say, preacher, that's just foolish. No, that's about as foolish is saying, I'm going to get ready for the battle once you get in the middle of the battle. you got to get ready for the battle back in the locker room. you got to get ready for the battle before the fiery darts ever come your way. If you wait till he's shooting, you lose. You're going to be defeated. You wait till the financial pressures come within your family to make a decision that we will not turn back on the Lord. We are not going to turn against the truth of the Word of God. If you wait till, it's, till you're in the battle, you've lost. If you make a decision, we will decide when our children get to this point what will be morally accepted. We'll decide once they start asking to do this or do that. Let me give you a heads up. You just lost. You better make your decisions. You better make your principles based on the Word of God and they are accurate. They are steadfast. They are unmovable regardless of circumstance or situation. You can't fluctuate with it. You can't say, well, well, let's see if that happens, then we'll make a decision. You got to be like the three Hebrew children that said, King, we're not careful to answer you in this matter. We got our mind made up. We don't need 24 hours to think about this. We have got our mind made up. All of us are in the war. Some cause more struggle than others for the enemy. And understand, he's going to come at you harder. But God gives us all we need to win the battle. I do not want to paint a negative picture in here tonight. It is negative in the sense that you are in a battle. But it is positive in the sense you don't have to lose the battle. He gives you everything you need to win the battle. Does that mean you're going to be perfect? You're going to be unscathed? You're never going to make a mistake? Folks, you know me better than that, and you know yourself better than that. Not going to happen. But you don't have to lose the battle. You don't have to lose the battle, because here's the reality. We are in a battle. If you take notes, I'd write this down. We are in a battle. But on Calvary, Jesus won the war. Now, we're in a battle. And it's a daily grind. It is a battle. Some people's battle is bigger than others because they pose more threat than others. Some people have laid down and quit. Why, why, why do you want to fight somebody who's not fighting back? You've got that one. But the beauty is this, Christian. Christ won the war at Calvary. When Jesus Christ rose again, he defeated death, he defeated hell, he defeated the grave. He defeated, read Romans sometimes, understand that the old man no longer has dominion over you. If you sin, and we do, I, I do right along with you, but understand this, if we do, if we do, we didn't have to, this hurts, we chose to. We didn't have to. Why? Because the enemy's been defeated. We chose to. 
We choose to do that. Let sin no more have dominion over your mortal body. Let it not reign in you, is what Paul tells the folks in Romans. God gives us what we need. If you look at it there, at the verse of Scripture again, he says that in verse 13, wherefore take unto you the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day. I don't think we need to spend a great deal of time tonight understanding that if there has ever been an evil day, we live in an evil day. I mean, we do. Pastor preached it. He told us again about it this morning. You guys understand that. I really believe that what Paul is writing to that church at Ephesus is the day that you live in is an evil day. It was back then for the church at Ephesus. It is now for us. If, if the Lord tarries and there are multiple generations after us, there will be evil days for them as well. There's always going to be a spiritual battle until Satan in Revelation is bound and cast in the bottomless pit. It's going to be. And it is always going to be that particular case. We live in it. But understand this. There is not going to be a treaty signed in this age of grace that we live in. There is not going to be a treaty signed that is going to cause this spiritual battle to cease. It's not going to happen. You know, we, we sign peace agreements with different countries and sometimes they're honored and many times they're broken. And the, sometimes at the signing of those things, wars will cease. There's not going to be one signed that's going to cause this war to cease. You, you're not going to experience that in this church age that you and I live in. It, you, it's not going to happen in your lifetime. So understand that. Okay, you and I may be raptured out of it someday, and that'd be wonderful. But the battle is going to exist. So here's the deal. From February the 2nd, 2014, if you never ever thought you were in a spiritual battle before, I promise you, from February the 2nd, 2014, till the day you breathe your last breath on this earth, you are going to be in a spiritual battle. There are days it will be worse than other days. There are days you'll be more successful than other days, but it's always going to be. It is always going to be. You don't have to lose it. You don't have to lose it, but you're always going to fight it. It's always going to be there in that evil day. He says there, having done all, verse 13, having done all, to stand kind of seems to me that God gives us the pattern to stand and says I want you to use all of it having done all not part of it I told you earlier about leaving areas exposed we'll talk about it when we get into the pieces but he says you've got to do all you can to stand. Think about it. I've laid it out for you. Here's the breastplate of righteousness, the girdle of truth, the helmet of salvation, the shoes of the preparation of the gospel of peace, the shield of faith. He's got it all laid out there. And he says, take all of it. Take all of it because you're going to be in a fight and you got to stand. You gotta, it's not going to be easy. It's not going to be a, a, a pushover. But do everything you can to stand. And then he says in there, in verses of Scripture there, he says in verse 11, put on, take it up. Do all that you can to stand in verse 13. You stand against the wiles of the devil, in verse 11, by applying the armor. Now here's the reality for anybody that's been in church any length of time. All of us know people 
who didn't stand, don't we? We've seen them get out of church. We've seen them get away from the Lord. We've seen them what we would call and use the term backslide. That's fine. It's a biblical word. It's fine for you to use that. But what happens when somebody backslides? What happens is this. They lost the battle. They lost the battle. They didn't lose their salvation if they were truly saved. But they lost a battle. They left something unprotected because everything was at their disposal to stand. Everything was at their disposal to win the battle. When Christ rose again, the enemy was defeated. Doesn't mean he's not still going to battle. Trust me, he still battles. But you don't have to give in to it. So we've all seen that person that has turned away from the Lord. The, real, the truth of the matter is also this. If we'll get honest, this is where it hurts. All of us have lost some battles too, haven't we? I haven't, but maybe some of you have. Listen, all of us have. If we say that we have no sin, what does 1 John say? I just taught you that the other day. We deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. We've all lost some battles. We've all lost some battles. We've got to make sure that we've applied the armor. We know folks who didn't stand. Our prayer of our own selves ought to be as the prayer in Hebrews, not to become a castaway. Not to become a castaway. You know what? The biggest fear of a believer's life ought to be this. Living a wasted life life that ought to be the biggest fear you can't lose your salvation so you, that fear is, is out of the picture but to come to the end of life losing battle after battle after battle and living a wasted life he said preacher I've got a pretty good life got a nice, nice family we got a nice house I mean it's a pretty good life listen Happy for you. But let me tell you what's really, really going to matter in eternity. What's going to matter in eternity is not the IRA, it's not the house, it's not the car. It is hearing these words, well done, thou good and faithful servant. I, you, now listen, tonight you disagree with me. Got it. I'm telling you, I promise you, there's a day you'll trade it all to hear those words. To hear those words, well done. You stood. There were battles. There were times you stood against the wiles of the devil that you gathered around and put that armor on. And he was shooting darts, and he was shooting darts, but you stood. And he shot that dart that seemed unfair sometimes. He shot that dart at one of your boys. He shot that dart at one of your girls. He shot that dart at your family. He shot that dart at your security. But you stood. Well done. Well done, thou good and faithful servant. You don't believe me tonight. I have a hard time with it too. I'm not going to lie to you. But I am telling you, if I understand the scriptures, we would trade it all to hear that one day. We would trade it all. All that this life has, because the reality is this. What is this life? James put it better than I'll ever put it. What is this life? He says it's just a vapor that appears for a short time, and then it vanishes away. Would you trade that for an eternity? Of well done. Well done. Now, I'm not saying you got to make the trade. You don't, you don't have to go trade everything in. If you do, trade it my way. I'm not saying you've got to do that. But I am telling you, there is a real battle. And that's the key. That is what is important. And a wasted life ought to scare us as much as anything. To think that I would live my four score and ten or whatever 
These knees aren't going to make it to 90. I can tell you that right now. Uh, right now I'm working on all original parts. That's not going to happen at 90. There will have to be some, some, uh, uh, some transfers made before then that, that happens. But whatever it is, I can't imagine that on your epitaph and mine said they lived a wasted life. A wasted life. There's a battle. It's constant. Should be our goal to be true to the end. Let's look at the first piece. I don't know how far I'll get with it. I'll go a few more minutes. But Ephesians 6.14 gives us the first piece. And it shouldn't be any, any surprise to us at all that the first piece is the truth. Because Get, get this, if I know that I am right, and I'm not talking about in an arrogant manner, but I know that I am right. I know the fundamentals of the faith. I know that the scripture is true. I know that there is a real heaven, that there is a real hell. I know that Jesus Christ died for me. I understand that. I know the inerrancy of of the scriptures. If I know that I've got the truth, I can stand for about anything, don't you think? It's when I wonder if I've got the truth or when I hope I've got the truth. Now all of a sudden my position's not near as strong, is it? It's not near as strong as when you know you've got the truth. He says the first thing that you've got to stand there for the first thing that you've got to understand is the truth. Having your loins girt about with truth. Understand this. So, Because if, if you get this, the rest of this series is going to make a lot of sense to you. We are on the right team. Everybody got it? Tonight the Broncos hope they're the right team. The Seahawks hope they're the right team. I'm telling you something, Christian. We are on the right team. We're going to win. Our captain has already won the battle. Revelation is true. We are going to spend eternity with the Lord Jesus Christ. Our God wins. Amen? He's going to win the battle. So understand that. And know that going in. You've got truth on your side. I, now, I preface that by saying, if I know I've got truth, I'm, I'm going to stand stronger, right? If I know the truth's on my side in a case, or if I know the truth's on my side in a witness situation or an argument, I can stand knowing i got the truth. Other people may stand against me, but I've got the truth. He says, you've got the truth. Take it first. Understand it first. He says, having your loins girt about with the truth. It was custom in that day, not just for the soldiers, but for really for all of the folks, to wear a very loose fitting tunic, but have a hole for the head and a hole for the arms. Almost, for lack of a better way to describe it, a robe type thing. Would have been very plain in color. Um, and they would have it would be very loose fitting with just these three holes in it. It would, have been cut, it would have been cut in a square with those three holes and just basically thrown over the shoulders. When you got in a battle or you needed to run, you needed to respond quickly. Now you think about it. I'm not trying to be foolish. I promise you. If you had that on, that was your garment and you were getting into a battle, or you were trying to move quickly, what would be, now don't, don't, I'm not being silly, what would be your first reaction with that loose-fitting clothes? You'd start trying to gather it up, wouldn't you? Because I know me, I'm falling with that on. Or my enemy's going to try to grab it. You watch these linemen tonight. Offensive linemen, their shirts will be so tight 
so the defensive lineman can't grab it and move them out of the way. You would want to gather all that up around you the best that you possibly could. He says, this is what you do. You put on the leather belt of the truth and you cinch it up tight around you because that's got to be your first level of protection is you're standing on the truth. You have got truth on your side. Now, John 17, 17 says this, Sanctify them through thy word. Thy word is what? Truth. Does the scripture matter? Let me tell you, I would like to do about six weeks on that. The scripture does matter. It does matter because it's truth. Everything else in life has got to be filtered through that. Our political positions are not based on parties. I'm sorry. That just busted some bubbles. It's not based on parties. You filter the platform of the individual through the truth. I should have more amens than that. You filter it through the truth. You filter this message through the truth. You filter your Sunday school lesson through the truth. You filter your position on an issue through the truth. You filter your stance that you take within your home through the truth. Everything comes through the truth. Sanctify them by the word. Thy word is truth. You want truth on your side in the battle. You want truth on your side. He said, start there. Get everything tied up. The principle is be ready to combat the enemy with truth because truth's on your side. Truth's on your side. Here's the beauty of it. It's never going to change. Get the truth. Hold the truth. It never changes. Know the word. Find him. We're going to talk about taking the, the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, in just a moment. Or n not in a moment. I'm sorry. In multiple weeks down the line. Some of you got so nervous right now. You thought you're going to miss the whole first half. I'm telling you, we win. Truth's on our side, but you're in a battle. Take the truth. Wrap yourself, tie yourself up tight with it. Get, get, it, get that tunic, get that loose, loose fitting thing that the enemy can grab. Tie it all together. Put it around the truth. Put the truth around it. Put the truth around the principles you raised those young people with, not just your idea. Put the truth around decisions you make in your life. Put the truth around what we stand for and what we believe. We need to know truth because if we don't, false doctrine will creep in and it will kill us. False doctrine, he, he, he'll use any crack he can use. You know why there are so many churches fighting and fussing right now? Because nobody put the truth on. They wouldn't know the truth if it hit them in the face. They know emotion. They know good music. But they don't know the truth. Folks, that's sad. That is sad that we have gone through our lives and we don't know the truth. It, it's a sad commentary on teaching. It's a sad commentary on preaching. And this hurts me to say it, but it's a sad commentary on parenting because that's where the responsibility lies. For me to teach mine the truth. There's no truth today. Know what you stand for. Ephesians 4.14 says that we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness whereby they lie in wait to deceive. Why are people swept away with false doctrine? They don't know truth. They never wrapped it around them. And they left something hanging loose out here and the enemy grabbed it. They left something hanging out loose. He told them, said, first thing, 
is cinch everything up with truth. You've got truth, ground in truth, put that on first. And we have entertained. It, it, it grieves me to share what I'm sharing. But in Christianity today, we have entertained. We have determined how we, humanly speaking, could build a crowd. And we have left truth out of the equation and our people are walking around unprotected for the battle. And we're losing. We're losing. We're going to talk about the entire armor of God over the next few weeks. Lord, I pray that you would help us with this very thing. Help us to be people that know, that love, that desire, that live on the truth. May we put truth in our life and stand on it and know that we truly are on the winning team. In Jesus' name.